Oh, I get to give him the thumbs up? Okay, we're good. Okay. So, um, I'm calling the meeting of the Environmental and Natural Resources Commission to order. It is uh, 7.02 on Monday, July 18th. So, um, we'll do a roll call real quick. Um, Commissioner Brodnax is has stepped down, so she is absent. Um, I'm, oh, what? Oh, sorry. Dozier, I'm getting an, sorry. <laughs> my brain's not working today. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so sorry, Commissioner Brodnax. You are here. Okay, lovely. Uh, Commissioner Redman? Here. Commissioner Pauser? Here. Uh, Commissioner Gill is absent. And was Commissioner Miller coming? No. Okay. So Commissioner Miller is also absent. Um, and then uh, approval of, uh, we did not meet in June of 2022, so approve the minutes of um, May 2022 their motion to approve our last I cannot vote because I need to abstain because I was not present for that oh no approve the we have to approve today's agenda first don't we do you want the paper packet I sometimes that's easier pack. if you're chairing yes, to have the hands-on I am so sorry no this worries. is um, is there, do we have a motion to approve this evening's agenda I'll move madam chair yes May I add one staff presentation? Yes, you may. I would like to add 9D Minnesota Climate Change Subcabinet Support Letter for EV Charging Ordinance. Nice. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will add that. Are there any other additions to the agenda? Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Brodnax. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Now on to approving from May of six, May 16, 2022. Um, do we have a motion to approve? Actually, can we even vote on that because we don't have enough people? Yes, you can vote on it. The you know, I, I wasn't here present for that meeting. Um, Madam Chair, I did look up the Roberts rules for because this happened uh, the meeting before. We had four members present and only two voted and two abstained. Okay. Uh, and it sounded like because it was a majority, then they were approved. So I think you'll be okay. Okay. Yeah. So do we have a motion to approve the minutes from May 19 or May 16? I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from May 16th, 2022 as submitted. Do we have a second? Uh, I'll second. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I also have Aye. to abstain. Oh, okay. So two, well, there were two abstentions. I guess I shouldn't have said I. We had two abstentions and two ayes, so that was majority, right? Perfect. Mm -hmm. I think it's all finished. Yeah, I think it's good. Um, on to new business then. Um, the first item is a resolution of appreciation for Kayla Dozier. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. So let me scroll to this item here. All right, so um, as you know, Commissioner Dozer, Kayla Dozer, has resigned from the Environmental and Natural Resources Commission. Her last uh, meeting was May 5th of 2022, and Commissioner Dozer um, served on the commission for one year and six months, from October 12th until, again, May 5th, 2022 and that was uh, from 2020 to 2022. So not completing her full term, which is three years, but nonetheless, we like to recognize our uh, commission members and um, our citizen members when they end their time of service on a commission. So the city will consider adoption of a resolution of appreciation, recognizing the individual for their time committed to serving in Maplewood. So as an attachment to your report, I do have the resolution of appreciation we are um, reviewing tonight for your consideration. And if this is approved, it will go on to our city council in August. Thank you. Thank you very much, staff. Um, do we have a motion to uh, approve the resolution of appreciation for Councilman Dozer? Or do we need to discuss? Do we need to discuss? I doubt that we need 
to discuss. Yeah, I, I'll make a motion to approve. I know, you know, Commissioner Dozer came on board uh, during the pandemic. That was mm -hmm. hard, I think, to start on a commission. I think it was hard, you know, hard for her to start or for anyone to start on a commission 100% um, remote. And so that was appreciated that she joined and um, definitely make a motion that we approve the resolution of appreciation. Great. All second. Thank you, Commissioner Redmond. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And no, so no objections. Motion carried. Um, and then also, so on to the next item on the agenda, Green Step Cities update. Yes, I thought I would give you an update on our progress with the Green Step Cities program. So I have a, a short, um, well, I have a few slides for you, some visuals, fun stuff. So I will uh, draw your attention to the overhead, please. Thank you. So Maplewood has been participating in the Green Step Cities program since 2010. Maplewood was one of the early adopters of the program uh, back when it was first started that year. Uh, it is a voluntary challenge assistance and recognition program to help cities achieve their sustainability and quality of life goals. The Environmental Commission and the Green Team, which of course is a group of city employees working on sustainability initiatives at a city operations level, you are both considered the steering committee for the city's participation in that program. So I wanted to let you know that the city was awarded the Green Step City Step 4 and Step 5 award once again this year. Uh, but first I wanted to highlight um, kind of how the Green Step Cities program works. There are, as you can see, different focus areas, buildings and lighting, land use, transportation, environmental management, and resilient economic and community development. And within there, there is 29 best practices, and then uh, nestled within those best practices are 179 excuse me, 175 action items. So in order to achieve uh, step one, a city needs to pass a resolution um, saying that they'll participate in the program. Uh, step two, you have to uh, start um, working on those best practices. Step three, complete a certain number of best practices. Step four, uh, start measuring those best practices. And then step five, uh, you have to um, show that you're making improvement on at least three of the, um, the key best practices. Getting some lagging here on my... Okay, no one likes the heat, I guess. So uh, one new best practice, uh, well, came out within the last few years I wanted to highlight for you um, is the Climate Adaptation and Community Resilience Plan, or excuse me, um, Resilient Economic and Community Development. So this is the best practice. And you can see the um, uh, strategies outlined there, one through eight. So this is uh, within the last, I guess, five years, um, things that the city of Maplewood has been working on, but something to consider. Um, just take a moment to look at that. Prepare to maintain public health and safety during extreme weather and climate change related events while also taking a preventative approach to reduce risk for community members. And we can see a real need for that uh, on days like today. Some of our vulnerable populations without uh, air conditioning and so forth. And of course the city of Maplewood has adopted our climate adaptation plan starting to work on some of those measures uh, to ensure our resiliency. Integrate climate resilience into city or tribal planning, policy, operations, and budgeting processes. And you know that's one area that we're looking at tonight, particularly the budgeting aspect. Increase social connectedness through engagement, capacity building, public investment, and opportunities for economically, economically, I'm just gonna leave it there, vulnerable residents to improve their economic prosperity and resilience to climate change. 
encourage private sector action and incentivize investment in preventative approaches that reduce risk and minimize impacts of extreme weather and the changing climate for human health and the built environment. Protect public buildings and natural constructed infrastructure to reduce physical damage and sustain their function during extreme weather events. Reduce the urban heat impacts of public buildings, sites, and infrastructure and provide resiliency co-benefits. Protect water supply and wastewater treatment facilities to reduce physical damage and sustain their function during extreme weather events. And improve local energy resilience by minimizing fuel poverty, installing distributed renewable energy systems, and developing microgrids that can improve energy system resiliency. And you can see all of the uh, best practices and um, the ones that the City of Maplewood has completed uh, at www.greenstep. Dot pca dot state dot mn dot us. And you can see all of the uh, cities that are participating. I believe there are, let's see, I think 140, I don't have it in front of me, 148 some um, cities within Minnesota that are participating in this program. So moving on, so that's, you know, we really want to key in on um, this best practice as we move forward with our policy suggestions. Well, now it's working. All right, so here is a fun visual for you. Um, this shows you um, after we measured those various um, metrics, which there are hundreds, and we have to look at this once a year uh, in the spring, and uh, we compare it to the last year's um, measurements. And so from 2020 to 2021, the city of Maplewood advanced on 14 eligible sustainability metrics. You know, there was a lot more that we advanced on, but these are the ones that, um, you know, you have to do at least three to advance, and we uh, were able to accomplish 14. So increase in LED street lights, uh, an additional 13%. And a lot of this is due to XL Energy converting their street lights um, within the city of Maplewood. Uh, we own a small percentage of street lights. Um, most of them are owned by XL Energy. Reduced energy use in city buildings. Uh, we reduced it by 16.8 kilobytes. Oops, I cut that off there. But, um, you know, maybe some of this had to do with the fact that, uh, you know, city staff weren't um, at the buildings um, in 2020 or 2021 reduced. You know, it's hard to say. Increase in city fleet miles per gallon for diesel and decrease in city employee vehicle miles traveled per person per day. And I believe we kind of addressed this uh, as we looked at the greenhouse gas assessment during our last meeting, um, kind of identifying that um, some of that, again, has to do with the pandemic and um, decreased uh, use of the vehicles. Increase in stormwater management assessment, um, we increased that by 4%. And this is a long series of questions that they ask about your ordinances and policies and practices having to do with stormwater management. Uh, so I fill that out in, uh, um, along with our engineering department and um, we've made some improvements there. And then that also kind of complements this climate adaptation assessment, um, which similar questions. And because we did complete that climate adaptation plan, uh, we increased our assessment percentage by 15%. So we're doing fairly well there. Uh, so then I'll get, go back up to the trees. Increase in number of new trees planted. Now they only count the trees that were you know, brand new, not the ones that were replacing uh, trees removed for, for emerald ash borer. And so these trees um, are the trees that were sold in the city of Maplewood's tree sale and uh, a few that were in our parks. We didn't have a big street project where we planted trees uh, last, or in 2021, and that would have increased that tree replacement. Increase in number of city-owned and private renewable energy generation sites, uh, of course, which also creates an increase in generation capacity of those sites. You know, I think we're seeing more and more um, residential properties and businesses installing those renewable energy, the solar panels and so forth. 
so it's becoming more feasible for them, so we're seeing an increase in those. Increase in public electric vehicle charging stations. So we had 36 and now we're up to 55 in the city of Maplewood, uh, scattered throughout the city. Um, increase in number of local food venues. I think I've missed a uh, decrease in greenhouse gas citywide assessment and decrease in greenhouse gas city operations. And again, we saw that during our presentation by uh, Commissioner Redman during our May meeting, but it was a, a reduction um, of 33% and 45%. And um, some of that, of course, due to the, um, I guess, the greening of our, of our grid with XL Energy bringing on more uh, like wind and uh, more renewable sources into the grid. Um, and of course, he, he went over some of those other uh, reasons for that decrease. Um, we see an increase in number of, or excuse me, yeah, an increase in the number of local food venues. Uh, so that would be things like um, the farmer's market, community gardens, um, market gardens. So we're up by uh, five of those um, from 11 to 16. And then finally, Decrease in city population vehicle miles traveled per person per day. And uh, we're seeing a reduction of five miles. Um, and of course, probably some of that has to do with uh, more people working from home. So we received our award uh, during the League of Minnesota Cities Conference in June. City Council Member Kathleen Juniman and I attended that and um, they had this set up where we could take a funny picture so here we are <laughs> so we will receive another uh, green step cities block to add to our our blocks we're gonna need a whole wall to start mantling putting that together so great job and thank you for your support and I'll just pause for any questions or comments you have on our program or ideas for moving forward um, with the uh, best practices thank you Thank you very much, and congratulations, City of Maplewood, for all their hard work in um, progressing towards making more energy efficient resources available. Um, what types of education, and you know, how are people getting the word out about the various things that the city has been doing? Um, are you communicating this through city newsletter, or how are our Maplewood residents able to see this information? Madam Chair, I, I was going to include include that infograph okay. uh, in the newsletter. Um, so we, we do that yearly. Okay. But I think the most important thing is to um, show by example, you mm -hmm. know, the things that we're, we're doing here. Uh, you may have noticed out in uh, City Hall campus here, we have the um, electric fences prepared for our um, urban agriculture. Um, we're bringing in um, the goats, <laughs> temporary keeping of goats, which of course um, this commission created that ordinance, so thank you. We were the first ones, uh, the city of Maplewood, to get a goat permit, temporary keeping of goats. Uh, so they'll be coming uh, soon. I, I thought it was today, but maybe the heat has kept them mm -hmm. away. But it's part of a grant uh, from, oh, and I apologize, I, Great River Greening, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, so they'll be um, eating and managing and uh, removing the buckthorn and other non uh, and other invasives within the city hall campus so pretty exciting so you can see you know leading by example it kind of it kind of shows oh look what the city's doing and maybe we could do something like this well, i've seen i've seen goats in action at various other wild places in the area and they do good work and they're pretty good hard-working city employees <laughs> so. okay. commissioner redmond so I just wanted to make the comment that first of all, this is an important accomplishment, not just to uh, a, can, to achieve this uh, award annually, but the fact that Maplewood has done it year after year after year and one of the first cities to get to the uh, step five and to stay there. Uh, so I think it just behooves us to recognize that that's, that's an important accomplishment by the city. And certainly there's lots of folks that participate in making that happen but I also would like to just recognize that you know Sean's contributions as lead staff on it are really crucial and so thank you Sean for all of your work to make that happen so thank you 
Um, you know, there have been some great accomplishments and things that have been made this year. Are there any goals that the city plans to be working on to further um, change for next year? I mean, things that you'd like that the city aims to be targeting for continuing to uh, build, like what Commissioner Redmond is saying, and con you know, track our uh, continue, you know, being a leader within Minnesota for um, various climate ad adaptations and energy efficiency. Well, Madam Chair, I'd also like to um, thank the commission <laughs> because I think that's where you know you're the think tank. You're where all the ideas come from. Mm -hmm. So no one wants to, you know. I work with these people every day. They don't. They get tired of me talking. But when I say the environmental commission recommended it, we'll look out. You know, mm -hmm. people start listening. So. I think it's important for you as uh, leaders in our community to continue to, um, you know, keep us progressive and moving forward uh, with these ideas. And, and I think um, the item that we'll be looking at later today or tonight, uh, the climate action financing and project priorities, you know, is, is key in uh, getting the city of Maplewood to, um, you know, set aside a designated fund or some sort of funding for our sustainability initiatives. So I think that will be key and other ideas coming from the commission. Sounds good. Are there any other comments or questions? That's the one that I'd add. You highlighted the additions to the program and those best practices. Um, some of those items we've, we've thought about um, in our comprehensive plan but then continue, I think it'll be important to continue to revisit those so that we make progress. It's sort of like the steps overall, like you commit to it and then you start to do it and then you need to measure what you're doing and improve on what you're doing. So um, with those new best practices, those um, seem like a really good thing to, to focus on, like kind of maintain and continue to improve the other areas too, but um, to start to make some, some good strides in, in these new areas would be think important going forward. Thank you very much, Commissioner Pauser. Okay. Um, well, I, are, I think we can get, continue moving on. And so next item is discussing the climate action financing and project priorities. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think I do have a few slides. It just kind of keeps it interesting. All right, here we are. So tonight, uh, this item is an item we have been uh, reviewing. It is um, the top-ranked goal of the Environmental Commission for this year, uh, working on our climate adaptation plan and uh, working on some of the implementation strategies outlined there, which is the climate action financing and project priorities. So as you know, in May of 2021, the City of Maplewood approved the climate adaptation plan the plan does outline strategic goals and detailed actions to guide the city towards a more resilient climate change ready condition. And the Environmental and Natural Resources Commission and Green Team once again serve as the city's climate te team charged with reviewing and supporting the actions of the climate adaptation plan. I don't have a paper copy, copy either, so it is a little tricky, huh? Oh, here. One moment. I don't need it. Don't need it. I am good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the plan does outline several implementation strategies, including identifying specific priority climate actions to implement yearly and the creation of a stable climate action financing mechanism to fund the projects. So we took a look at this um, in May, and we came up with a few draft uh, proposals for priorities for funding. And they, um, I also added this climate mitigation plan, which, 
you know, is something outlined in our comprehensive plan and um, the city of Maplewood did uh, apply for a grant uh, through the MPCA resiliency uh, fund to cover the cost of that mitigation plan that was in January. However, we were not uh, given the funding for that. So I think it's really key for the city to, you know, next step is to put away, put, you know, fund this plan and, and make sure that we are working on our mitigation strategies, not just adapting to our climate, which I know we are working on much of it, but if we had a, um, a plan that we can follow and um, we're all on the same page, you know, that is so important uh, to make progress. Mm -hmm. So I think that should be top priority. Um, so I added that, and of course it came from you, but it just wasn't necessarily on this list. It was in our comp plan. Then we talked about the uh, city facility rooftop solar feasibility and funding study. And we identified uh, the two new city buildings uh, where the rooftop solar is most feasible, Wakefield Park Community Building and the new North Fire Station. So the city should review solar and financial options for installing solar on these two buildings in the short term. So let's do that right away, as soon as we can, right? So uh, we did have a proposal um, when Wakefield Building was first being constructed for a um, power purchase agreement where the city would lease uh, the solar uh, over a number of years. Um, of course, Excel Energy would, would get the RECs, the renewable energy credits. Um, but there was some... It was kind of a new type of agreement, and there was some legal concerns at the time. But I'm having uh, another look at that uh, by a couple companies um, for Wakefield, uh, the North Fire Station, as well as uh, possibility of our uh, South Fire Station, which you know is probably about 10 years old now, on uh, McKnight Road near 3M, and then also you know outright purchase. So I'll be. Um, working with a couple companies to give us some bids on the city of Maplewood actually, um, you know, purchasing the solar, you know, to own. And then, of course, the city of Maplewood would retain those renewable energy credits um, and, you know, they would count towards our, um, our goal of having renewable energy um, for our city facilities. So the long term then uh, should be reviewing opportunities for adding solar on other city buildings. So, you know, my approach would be to work with these companies and come up with um, financial and uh, different scenarios uh, and bring that back to the Environmental Commission for a recommendation to the City Council. So that would be, you know, the short term, but this long term you know, we'd, we'd continue to work on. So I'll just pause there. Do you have any comments on on that project priority? Uh, staff, I do have one qu question comment um, just regarding the, uh, regarding the addition of solar at various city properties. And we have within the city property the Maplewood Nature Center. And I'm where is the nature center in priority of getting solar? You know, I'm seeing that as a space where it's a good showcase for, to show residents what solar options are available. And with the with programming uh, resuming in that space, uh, it would be it's a place where people are coming, and they'd be able to see. And so, I, I, if we're looking at putting things within the fire stations um, and Maplewood Park. I'm just would the nature center also be a, you know within that first round or is coming later? Mm. Good question. So uh, the Nature Center actually has solar, oh. uh, but it's mainly a demonstration piece. Um, it's it's on the front of the building. It's kind of like a canopy, and it was installed, gosh, I think that was the first solar we had in Maplewood. Uh, it was part of a grant fund when, uh, let's see, the state of Minnesota was funding solar at various trailheads and different parks. Uh, so we we were able to get that installed. Um, but yes, we should really look at that with the overall city buildings. That building is quite old, so I'm not sure about the structural ability to support, you know, on the roof, but we can take a second look at, you know, the solar. Yeah, and uh, when the Nature Center was open, uh, we did, and it's still there, it's just the computer's not set up, 
but um, it there's a demonstration that shows you how shows the kids and adults how the solar works, and um, the computer showed you real live time on um, what kind of solar was being produced by that particular uh, solar arrays. Um, but the computer's not working on that now, so we'd have to. We've been back what a couple months. <laughs> Everything's not quite up to par, but. Um, that's a very good point because you want, you want to demonstrate. Uh, we also had another demonstration um, uh, kiosk sign um, that was showing the amount of solar that was being produced um, on the city facilities and then on the, the YMCA community center. And that first was at the YMCA, then it was at City Hall, then they redid that, boo, 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 boo. Suddenly, the giant sign found its way in my office one day. <laughs> so you can see that these educational things really need to, you know, be updated, and it just wasn't fitting where people needed it. So, but yeah, that that is a very good point uh, to also kind of demonstrate with your education, you know, how the solar is working. Thank you. Uh, yes, Commissioner Red. Uh, yep. So. Um, just a, a comment, I am recalling back when the Wakefield Park community building was being built, we had the opportunity as a commission to look at some of the plans. Um, that was definitely something that we encouraged at that time for that for solar to go on that building. And then looking at maybe cost, budget, you know, what was budgeted for the building, it went down to, okay, let's make this solar ready. And then, you know, as you described, uh, Sean, there, you know, were some issues with what arrangement would it be and how could that be, you know, is that an agreement that the city would want to get into? Um, but I think going forward with how we've advanced just in the last few years since that's come in front of the commission, I think for additional buildings, um, newer buildings that are coming before us, like we do want to continue to push for that. Um, it's good that we're getting bids and, and looking at, um, you know, the different options as far as purchasing outright or doing the purchase agreement where Excel uh, would own it. I mean, ultimately, you get renewable energy. We prefer to get the RAC credits for the city to continue to advance our own initiatives. But, um, you know, regardless, we, we want those things to happen. Um, but it also would be maybe a little bit interesting to look at that cost now, okay, the building was completed a couple of years ago. Now we need to go back and spend some more money to get the solar in versus making that uh, investment up front. Um, maybe that would be some good information then for the next time that the city is looking to plan. How can we do this from the start where all of the values and initiatives that we have in front of us are considered even if there is a cost to them? Because ultimately there's a cost to all of this, you know, for not just the construction of it, but for the planet as well. That's why we're interested in talking about these things. So I just wanted to add those, like it's good to see that these things are progressing forward, but also maybe using this as a bit of a case study then for the next go around that we might have opportunity to review. Thank you very much, for, uh, Commissioner Pauser. Do we have any other comments or questions, clarifying questions? Okay, so I'll move on to city fleet okay. study. Um, we, after looking at the greenhouse gas assessment, uh, determined that our fleet uh, was a, a big cause for uh, greenhouse gases in the city of Maplewood. So the city should conduct a study to determine how to create a greener fleet. The study will review and make recommendations on the city's existing fleet and usage, management and maintenance strategies, and time frame for converting to more fuel efficiency and electric hybrid vehicles. So the city has had fleet studies conducted in the past, but never a study to determine how the vehicles can be converted to a greener fleet over time. And I think key here would be um, the management strategy on how we replace vehicles. Um, you know, to me, uh, I've researched this, worked with our uh, fleet superintendent, but it does appear that if someone needs a vehicle, they ask for it and then they get it. You know, there's not really uh, a strategy for determining 
which is the best vehicle. You know, it's as far as uh, the climate and uh, our energy goals and so forth. So um, having, you know, more of a handle on that, more of a strategic goal as to where we're going, you know, rather than, oh, you need a police vehicle? Well, pick one, you know. So I think that would be very beneficial. So I'll pause there for any comments on the city fleet study. Um, I'm just thinking within reflecting on my past experiences of when there was not a fleet vehicle available for my use or other staff use, many times people would choose a personal vehicle and request re uh, mileage reimbursement. And so how does that personal vehicle mileage um, impact any of the requirements for or the um, gain, the uh, factor into any of the fleet decision making and uh, usage of a city owned vehicle? Well, we do track that and uh, we look at that during the greenhouse gas assessment. Okay. Um, employees that use their personal vehicle for a city purpose uh, are reimbursed at a certain rate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, clearly this. Um, Fleet study would identify, you know, okay. is it more beneficial to just let uh, employees utilize their vehicle and we reimburse them, or, you know, is it more cost effective to go this way? So, I think that would be part of the study. Um, I do know that in my time with the city of Maplewood, um, at least in the departments I've been in, uh, you had a car available and now it's gone because. You got this other employee that does that, and and so all these old cars are just kind of getting shifted around, you know. And then the police get all the new cars. <laughs> so, uh, so I can respond a little bit to that, or add a little bit to that, and then I've got a comment on the uh, fleet study in general. So, and from a GHG perspective, the. Uh, individual use vehicles certainly is a contributor and something that we should definitely explore but it is a small portion overall the, the city fleets for you know like public works and police and fire and you know all those sorts of uses um, is definitely the largest uh, contributor in terms of transportation for the city uh, for the municipality I should say so my other comment would just be um, you know and I uh, I'm a big fan of solar so I don't Get, don't don't take this wrong. I think this the rooftop solar feasibility and funding study is really important in terms of priority. In other words, if well you can you can only do project three after you do project two kind of a thing. I would tend to take the fleet study and nudge it upward, uh, swap those two only because um, again rooftop uh, the solar potential and getting that mapped out and kind of making a plan for the city is very important. So I'm not speaking against it. But in terms of addressing the municipality's uh, GHG missions, the fleet um, is going to be, I think, the tougher of the two nuts to crack. Um, our electric grid is, is getting cleaner. It'll continue to get cleaner. Again, not saying that solar is not important. It is. But the fleet, if we don't get in front of that, will be much further behind the curve. Just I'm not, nothing against Maple. It's just the way things move. So. Kind of getting out in front of that and mapping that out, I think, would be very important for the city to be able to make um, you know, financial investments that make sense, both in terms of function of vehicles, as well as aligning with uh, city goals. So, I, I for one, would say I'd bump that one up. Thanks. Thank you for uh, Commissioner Redman. Uh, do we have any other questions or uh, clarifying questions or comments? I'll move on to electric vehicle charging stations, uh, looking at a feasibility and funding study. So we did identify three new city facility parking lots where electric vehicle charging stations are most feasible. Well, they say that Wakefield Park Community Building was constructed to be electric vehicle ready, but I, I have to assess that. Uh, the new North Fire Station was not necessarily, uh, and it's already built, so but it is new. And then there is a future parking lot proposed at Goodrich Park. 
and the city should review electric vehicle charging station options at these parking lots in the short term and then conduct a citywide charging station study to determine existing locations, areas of need, and funding strategies. And outlined by this commission is um, to ensure that we're looking uh, citywide. You know, where are those existing um, charging stations and what areas, regardless if it's a city property or not, um, is there a real need for that? And this will be uh, important as we move forward with um, the possibility of funding uh, from the federal government for uh, the electric vehicle charging station. So having, you know, a study in place and showing that we're uh, ready to um, implement uh, will be important. So I'll pause for comments on that. Being that there isn't a study, I'm not certain about this, but my gut tells me that there's not a lot of people that would drive to the fire station to plug in. You know, So I think um, getting a, a real handle on citywide, where are charging stations existing now? Where would they be most useful? You know, by retail, by, um, I, I, like I'm not, I, I don't think a fire station is one and, and parks, a lot of people walk to parks. I think fewer people drive to parks, but um, again, gut feel, there's no study, so it would be great to have a better concept of that. Um, and I think this stands out to me really as an, an area that, you know, a lot of uh, we're measuring, you know, things both from like what is the city done and what, you know, are individuals within the city doing, but, um, you know, partnering with businesses on this and, and maybe looking a little bit more. Um, I don't know that it needs to be focused on, on city property. Um, that won't be used, but encouraging and incentivizing in some way locally, if we can, for other businesses and organizations to have those charging stations available for the public there. And just uh, I'll I'll chime in and, and be <laughs> supportive of the, the the core comment of the importance of doing this study. You know, it's a good indication. There's really sort of four levels they might make a decision around that first is city equipment you know electrifying uh, city uh, transportation or vehicle equipment the second is city staff you know we want to make sure that we're supporting uh, the transition amongst city city staff it's a large employer in the city so making sure that you know what locations make sense from a staffing perspective and sites that have lots of come and go and lots of staff you know bringing their personal vehicles uh, the third is visitors to that location so the public that are coming to a city facility for one reason or another and then of course the fourth is supporting their greater community so all those layers uh, i mean it, it can be a relatively complex matrix when you start looking at those things so a good study would help to uh, outline all that so yeah i think it's it's a it would be a, a great project to get accomplished Um, well, I go. Go ahead. That's a great photo. <laughs> you should frame it and put that next to the steps. Oh, I didn't even have my microphone on. I apologize. Um, during our last meeting, we discussed um, the city finance director's guidance on uh, coming up with the list of climate action priorities, uh, presenting that to the city council during the budgeting process, and having them come up with a way to fund that. And uh, so that's how it was presented. And the Environmental Commission um, took a pause and said, you know, I think it would be best if we had these ideas and concepts uh, for the city council to consider at the same time. So um, based on the climate adaptation plan, I did a little tiny bit of research uh, into these various um, financing options. So on the stormwater fees, 
Um, you know, Maplewood does collect an environmental utility fee. It's based on the amount of impervious surface on each property and the impact to the city's drainage system. So like the Maplewood Mall, which has a large amount of hard surface, they're paying much more for this environmental utility fee than uh, an, an area that doesn't have as much parking space and so forth. And then all residential properties also pay into this. Um, you can get a, um, a reduction in that fee, by, by the way, if you add a um, stormwater best practice, such as a rain garden, and that's improved by our engineering department, and uh, they go out and inspect that, and then uh, it's a 30% reduction in that fee. Um, so that's something to incentivize people to manage stormwater on their own property. So the fund does pay for stormwater management, including street sweeping, storm pipe maintenance, and wetland and ponding area maintenance. And then in my research, I think this is correct, the fund could also cover tree planting, tree maintenance, and ongoing management of trees that assist with capturing stormwater. Um, and that's a huge need here in Maplewood now uh, with uh, emerald ash borer, you know, and uh, all the ash trees that the city will have to remove. Um, we're undergoing that project now in our streets. Uh, we don't really have a handle on it in our parks at this time. Uh, but yearly we are um, removing and replacing hundreds of trees. Uh, so coming up a way, with a way to fund that will be very important as we move forward. So maybe that's something the city could look at. Um, but then I, it, is, it was unclear to me if the fee could cover other resiliency actions. So I'd, I'd have to have the city attorney take a look at something like that. And I'll pause for comments on that. All right, I'll move on. Um, and I'll, uh, well, at the end, I'll, I'll tell you how we can wrap this all up in a nice pretty bow and, um, and where it will go and how it will move forward. So the resilience penny property tax, um, this is, uh, well, first I wanted to point out that yearly the city council assesses the need for an increase or decrease in the city's property tax based on the budget needed to cover the cost of running the city. So, you know, all our departments, maintaining our streets, maintaining our parks, um, all the projects that are moving forward, um, paying employees, so on and so forth. So the city could approve a property tax increase to cover the cost of a resiliency projects needed to adapt to changes in our climate. And of course, that's probably a, a large um, challenge, maybe. I don't know. Uh, especially now, um, we've seen over the past few years with uh, the pandemic and um, a lot of people losing their jobs and uh, many cities um, not even increasing their levy at all, you know, maintaining it at uh, a zero percent increase or maintaining the existing levy or excuse me taxes um, so you know that might be a bit of a challenge but something that the city can do um, I don't know why you'd have to call it a, a resiliency penny property tax or maybe you're just being more um, transparent in what you're using it for maybe I could see if you have any insights on that. I, I, think, uh, I think of it in terms of as a convenient name for the discussion, but not necessarily a needed title, uh, you know, when a specific proposal comes forth. But clearly, you know, communicating it as this is the intent, this is why it's there, and the intent is to use it for these kinds of projects and to bake that into the accounting of it probably all makes an awful lot of sense so that we can account for it, you know, that it generates X amount of revenue and that revenue is going to pay for A, B, and C that's supporting resilience for the community. That probably makes sense, but its name maybe evolves. Mm -hmm. And for instance, is it a penny? Is it a dime? Is it a dollar? You know, what's the right value? You know, that probably, so I, I, I would say that the name is really convenient, but it's more of a preliminary moniker. <laughs> so that's what that is basically, is the city uh, increasing taxes. Yeah. Okay. And it's not, it's uh, property taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, I did research. There have been cities that have done this for, you know, on um, regular taxes, in, uh, not like income taxes or, you know, the retail. But then you're adding a city tax, which I'm sure is politically charged and challenging. Yeah. All right. Capturing energy savings. So I did identify the current community solar garden agreement. In May 2018, the city entered into a 20-year agreement. It generates approximately $8,200 of energy savings yearly. And the savings currently offset the city's electric bills. So these funds could be set aside yearly for resiliency projects. <clears throat> And, you know, right now they're just kind of absorbed by the existing electric bills. So it's a credit on our XL energy bill. And, of course, our energy bills are more than the credit we're receiving. So it's, it's just helping pay for our, our energy bill, really. But, again, as far as transparency, you could, uh, you know, capture that and put it in a fund. And then moving on to um, <clears throat> utility franchise fees. The city collects franchise fees from XL Energy to recover the cost to maintain and operate streets, sidewalks, and trails. The fee is collected in lieu of other permits or fees for the use of the city's right-of-ways. XL Energy passes those fees on to its customers. Franchise fees could also be used to help the city's climate and energy efforts. As an example, uh, in my research, um, I found that the city of Mi Minneapolis uses the franchise fees to match grants for energy improvements for residential or commercial customers and to buy down loans for customers in what they call the green zones with lower than average household income. So Maplewood would have to renegotiate its franchise fee agreement uh, with XL Energy to get clean energy commitments. You could get that in addition to funding for new projects related to renewable energy, energy storage, and more. So right now those funds are being uh, used specifically uh, within our streets for uh, reconstruction of streets and so forth. So those are the climate action financing ideas um, that we'll include in this report. Um, I'll just pause for comments on those four and see if you have any additional information you wanted to add. I just have a quick question. Um, and you'll forgive me because I wasn't at the last meeting. Um, I know you met with the finance director. Did, did you guys discuss at all like a high level or preliminary target that you're trying to hit um, in terms of size of funding or is that kind of to be determined still as well? Well, we, um, our goal is to number one, put together the project priorities and, and do that yearly and, and map that out and have an idea that way of what our funding might, might be. So um, no, we don't have Okay. That was kind of her comment, too, was, well, we don't know, you know, it's doubtful that the city council is just going to approve a fund right. or we're going to set aside, whatever, $10,000 yearly for resiliency projects without knowing what those projects are. Okay. So. I, uh, if I may, it, to a certain extent, it's kind of, I think it is appropriate to have a fund established without necessarily knowing the specific projects because I would think the intent is to build momentum and therefore saying this is a commitment or it's an important uh, uh, effort. We're going to make sure that there's funding available each year. But before it's spent to identify, okay, for next year, we're going to, you know, the suggestion is using it for A and B, you know, and here's the fees for it or costs or whatever. So that before it's released, it would be verified. But I, I think actually it would be an important feature and whatever the funding mechanism is to know that it's a fund being established to support appropriate efforts, you know. Because I, I, otherwise you'd have to map out like, 
how, how far out in advance do you need to map what specific projects it is and to cost change between now and year three or year four, you know? So I would suggest that it's a feature to have it to be determined. A set amount yearly, but uh, since this is our first go around, they would establish it based on maybe some of the needs that we bring up in our priorities. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and operationally, operationally then, you know, uh, whether it's, however it's processed, but certainly through the city's budgeting process, the, you know, the city's green team, city's climate team could bring forth specific uh, appropriate projects for next year's fund allocation, you know, to be approved. So, so that the city council isn't just, you know, uncomfortably approving X dollars to be spent on something they don't know, but they're approving a commitment and a process. You know, we have a commitment to fund and here are the tools or tool we'll use, give it a try. <laughs> and we know that we, we trust that the city's uh, climate team will come forth with appropriate budgets for our, rec for our approval as council, you know, that kind of a thing. You know, in the budgeting process, um, and we used to bring this to the Environmental Commission um, years past, but it starts with this capital improvement um, projects, you know, coming up with um, a five-year strategy for funding uh, projects that are over $50,000. And usually those are things like improvements, um, like when you're uh, refurbishing a park or, um, you know, street reconstruction projects. So. Um, maybe there's an opportunity in the CIP to call out our climate resiliency actions because, you know, that's already built into this budgeting process. And then based on that, you know, every year you, number one, take a look at the CIP, what's coming up. Should we include that in budget? Do we have the money or should we bump that another year? I do think that's important for consideration too, that the, um, creation of a fund doesn't mean that some of the climate or some of the um, initiatives that need to be advanced shouldn't be considered in the overall city budget. Mm -hmm. Like this shouldn't be the only way to, to cover them. So, um, you know, it should be considered in the overall budget of a, of a project or, you know, in the overall budget each year. Um, but so uh, I, I think that this was presented like it's a discussion item and these are possible uh, or mechanisms for, for funding these. What, what are you looking for, Sean, from us to kind of move this forward? Um, you know, as we're listening to these different options, there's certainly like, oh, yeah, that's a thing. Or maybe combined with this, that could be a, a thing. Um, you know, we, certainly there's different optics to all of this and transparency and, you know, knowing that ultimately the money comes from, from somewhere as well. So kind of curious what we should be focusing on or what kind of recommendations you're looking for or direction from, from us as far as next step of what to do with this new information. Yes. So I thought we could finalize our review, which we have just done. I received all your comments. Uh, I'll be bringing it to the green team for their final review then drafting a report kind of summarizing uh, our um, climate adaptation plan, you know, the implementation strategies outlined in there, um, some of our goals, you know, all the background information that's important when you're presenting something like this uh, to the city council. And then, uh, of course, work with our finance director on the best timing. Um, you know, of course, the budget process for this year is already midstream, so anything we'd be looking at would be for next year, but you know, we need to get it in front of them. So then present it to the city council for their consideration and, um, and then start working on that during uh, next year's budget process. So it would be an actual report that would be coming from the Environmental Commission and the Green Team. And so I would recommend uh, letting me work on that uh, and then in August we'll have that report that you can, uh, you know, recommend approval of. Okay. So these are just kind of concepts we're all looking at. And we'll spell them out a little bit more clearly as well as the background information in the report. Unless you have other ideas. 
I, th I think that sounds good. Um, it was hard, or it is hard for me, I guess, to get a concept of like the size and scope. So, you know, truly the the eight thousand two hundred dollar number is the only actual number, you know, in there. So it's hard for me to kind of wrap my head around what sort of um, actual revenue some of these could could generate. You know, we talked about like property tax, and um, I think everybody kind of knows what that is. Like that, I mean. It's, People grumble about what it is, but understand um, the concept there. And I think that there's a fair amount of transparency as well as if you're, you know, calling it resiliency or calling it climate mitigation funding, something, you know, that's clear to the payers of those property taxes. Uh, whereas, for example, the utility franchise fee is something that people are probably not aware of. And the fact that, you know, we're charging this to Excel and Excel is, you know, turning around and charging that back to, to customers, that seems to lack the transparency that maybe we would want um, people to know and understand in the creation of this fund as well. So, um, yeah, lots of, you know, maybe kind of thoughts along those lines, but the more information, the better as we kind of, you know, review that report, get information um, as far as what the green team, city green team is thinking about it as well. They may have a different perspective and some more information to add, and then we can take a closer look next month. So I think that sounds like a good plan. Yeah, it, it will be important to come up with some sort of amount mm -hmm. to propose. And um, that'll take maybe some research, look at what other cities are doing, um, um, getting some estimates on, on the, or the initial priorities that we're proposing, mm -hmm. estimates on the cost of those taking a look at the overall budget and, you know, what we're spending uh, to kind of adapt to our climate right now, really. So, yeah, it'll take a little research. But you're, you're right, it's, it's kind of like grappling with coming up with this fund where you don't really know how much you need. Mm -hmm. yeah. So look for a draft uh, report in August. And this will go to our green team uh, end of July. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so on to visitor presentations. And seeing no visitors, we can then move on to commissioner presentations. OK. Um, so staff, um, would you like to sh share with us some, what some of the happenings that have been going on in our community? Yes, uh, under staff presentations, I wanted to update you on the Waterfest event, which was held Saturday, June 4th. So the Environmental Commission had a booth out there, and Commissioner Miller and myself were there, as well as the Friends of Maplewood Nature. They had a booth near ours. And um, as you helped us uh, put together this concept, it was called Cool Your Corner of the World. And uh, we looked at ways that um, residents could make um, changes to their own yard, to their own house, uh, to help mitigate uh, and uh, adapt to our changing climate. So we were a real hit, I have to tell you. Um, we wore our blue sunglasses, and we looked real cool. <laughs> and uh, we were one of those passport stops. So um, you know they have those passports for kids. They stop at various uh, booths. They get a stamp, and then they turn in their passport, and they get prizes. So that always draws in the kids. And then um, uh, Commissioner Miller is excellent with children. And uh, so I was kind of observing what she was doing, and then I got real theatrical out there, too. So it was a really fun day, but it was packed. To the brim because you know gosh we haven't had this event in what two years and it was a beautiful day and I lost my voice by the end of the day so if I ever go into teaching I cannot like I don't want to say scream because I didn't scream at the kids but <laughs> you know there's just so many of them so it was really fun and uh, this this helped us meet um, you know our climate adaptation implementation strategy of educating the public uh, on these strategies so Thank you for your assistance in that, and uh, thank you to Commissioner Miller for her work and uh, being there. Uh, just a real quick question. How many, do you have an estimate of how many people came by the table? No. Um, okay. Usually the Waterfest, they, they do 
kind of summarize how many people they think attended. Um, hundreds. I'm going to say hundreds. 200. And it was funny because um, many of the booths, they, they give out native plants, you know, like the Watershed District. And so Commissioner Miller had brought some plants kind of as a demonstration of how, you know, you can plant your yard and keep it shaded and so on and so forth. Well, people saw the plants and they thought, oh, free plants. <laughs> <laughs> so while she was busy, you know, with the kids in the back, you know, the, ki the parents were like, taking some of her plants. So we eventually had to hide the plants. <laughs> oh, it was funny. But hopefully those plants went to a good home. <laughs> All right, moving on. So, of course, that is our number one way of uh, getting at uh, the public. Uh, there's St. Paul residents, of course, because it's in St. Paul, but there are so many Maplewood residents that you meet out there. So some upcoming events, Harvest Park Native Seed Garden Open House. So we've been working with um, the organization Urban Roots. Um, they uh, planted this native seed garden with, of course, native plants. And it's year four now, so it's the, the first year where they will be able to actually harvest the seed for restoration projects, which is what they'll use the seeds for. Uh, Harvest Park Native Seed Garden is about one and a half acres um, in size. It is on parkland within Harvest Park. And um, part of the agreement with this group is that, you know, they'll do some education uh, with us. And they do um, employ youth from east side of St. Paul. We also advertise to our Maplewood residents, and I do know that there's a few Maplewood uh, youth that are working with this group now. Um, so this event will be Saturday, July 23rd at 10 a.m. It's a one-hour event. Um, we'll have the Urban Roots Youth Group out there. They'll talk about the history and purpose of the garden and uh, what Urban Roots does. Uh, we'll have a native plant identification walk. So there's so all sorts of varieties of native plants out there. So it's interesting, you know, if you're not familiar with some of the plants, uh, they'll have identification markers on them, and they're very knowledgeable, so that we'll walk around and look at all those plants. And then we're also, um, David Woods, who is um, the coordinator out there, he said that you would be surprised at the amount of birds he sees out there. So he thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of bring in some, some people to look at um, the birds that visit the garden. So we'll have a local bird expert. It'll ac actually be um, John Z. I'm sorry, I, I would mispronounce his last name. But the president of the Friends of Maplewood Nature, he is an avid uh, birder. So he will be out there and guiding uh, kind of this little bird hike that we'll do. And then pop-up native plant sale or native plant giveaway and then kid-friendly bird activities. So if you wanted to help out at that event or just show up, please do so on Saturday, July 23rd at 10 a.m. It's a one-hour event. Free to all. And then National Night Out is coming up Tuesday, August 2nd. Um, this was back in 2018, I believe, at um, one of our manufactured home parks. This is a Rolling, Rolling Hills Manufactured Home Park, and we were doing some energy outreach uh, when we were participating in the Partners in Energy program, um, so that was fun. And we're looking at doing uh, something similar this year uh, with our Clean Energy for All project that was um, part of the Clean Energy Resource Team uh, seed grant the, that the City of Maplewood uh, received and working with our partners, um, Center for Energy and Environment and CUB, which is, um, oh, what's that acronym? Citizens something something energy. Anyway, they'll help people uh, understand and review and look at uh, their energy bills. You know, like you said, a lot of people don't know that there's this uh, franchise or utility franchise fee that's on there. Like, what's that $2? Where does that go? So they really help people understand their bills and, and make sure that um, they're monitoring them closely. 
So I, I thought we could do some tabling. At, we have three manufactured home parks, um, Beaver Lake Estates, Rolling Hills, and Town and & Country. And I have a call into all three to see if they're hosting a National Night Out party. And I have got to tell you that this National Night Out party in 2018, they had the best barbecue. <laughs> yeah, so I was really hoping they were going to have a party. But I did hear back from them that due to staffing shortages, um, they're going to instead have a barbecue closer to um, the school year. So, But um, we're looking for volunteers. If, you'd love, if you would like to help us out, um, it's a great way to meet residents in the city, uh, to let them know about uh, the Environmental Commission, what we're doing, and um, hear their feedback on, on where they think the city should be going with our environmental policy, and also to do this energy outreach. Really, it will be signing people up for these mainly free home energy squad visits um, that will help them uh, reduce their, their energy burden. What are the times for National Oh, Day? and uh, people are signing up for the parties, and um, then the police and fire and other city personnel um, visit. Uh, so the hours that they specify are 5 to, I think it said 9. But, you know, we don't have to be out there all, all the time. But So maybe our group would be 5 to, you know, 2 hours, something like that, 5 to 7. So I will send uh, an email kind of summarizing that, and you let me know if you're interested. We've been, uh, the Environmental Commission has been doing this for years. Uh, years ago, we used to distribute um, recycling bins back when we were using the bins. Um, our recycling uh, contractor, they'd load up the truck with all those red bins, and we'd show up at parties, and people were all excited. <coughs> oh, I need a bin. So, <laughs> so we've been doing something similar uh, for many years. All right, and then I did add one item, and uh, I copied the letter for you here, uh, but it is the Minnesota Climate Change Subcabinet Support Letter for EV Charging Ordinance. And um, this was received by uh, Green Step Cities Coordinator. They sent this out to various cities um, looking for um, cities to sign on to this letter. And uh, it does identify that many cities in Minnesota are in various stages of passing policies requiring electric vehicle charging readiness in new parking infrastructure. In December 2021, the city of Minneapolis was notified by the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry that their EV charging ordinance scheduled to take effect January 1st, 2022 was not enforceable. The letter requests interagency coordination on EV policies to enable local governments to proceed with EV readiness ordinances that are necessary to support state and local goals for transportation, electrification, and greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And um, I do know that reviewing the city of Maplewood's uh, parking um, regulations was something that our city council wanted to review um, and I know that our community development department had been uh, starting that process. So, you know, this is something that Maplewood will be looking at. Uh, we do, you know, we added several new multifamily housing units in the city um, over the last few years. And, you know, an ordinance such as this would require a certain percentage of the parking spaces to have EV charging stations, um, things like that. And I must admit, I didn't review too closely Minneapolis's ordinance, um, and I guess I don't know why it was not enforceable. Perhaps I'll, I'll open it up. Maybe some of you know more than me. But um, they are looking for Maplewood support uh, by Wednesday. So rather than just me signing this, I thought I would um, make sure we have some uh, feedback from our Environmental Commission. Yeah, thank you. I uh, I have not read through the Minneapolis ordinance in great detail, so I'm uh, I know the framework of it though. Basically, it's uh, it just takes, of course, you know, cities identify parking requirements, but it's standard practice to identify have some sort of a parking ordinance. So this is a modification to their parking ordinance to spell out um, EV considerations, uh, charging considerations in association with parking. 
Uh, so it identifies, you know, uh, buildings for which, you know, parking lot areas for which EV requirements uh, are not are not required. And then uh, for, you know, sizes of facilities, uh, spelling out what kind of charging is required. What I don't recall is whether it is explicitly calling out for charging equipment to be installed or if it's explicitly calling out for EV ready, which would be defined as enabling uh, EV to be installed, the chargers to be installed. That part I can't recall. But in a quick overview, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a pretty, uh, it's a pretty common kind of uh, ordinance change that I'm seeing cities do all over the country, cities that are pursuing mitigation. I mean, these are, these are very common kind of ordinances. So I personally was really disturbed by the fact that uh, we've got one department in the administration where the state of Minnesota has very clear greenhouse gas goals that have been established for, you know, 15 years now. Uh, and uh, transitioning to uh, electric vehicles is something that's a clear goal of the city or the state. Um, the state's done EV planning. Uh, and how would they, it's, it does feel kind of like the left hand and the right hand don't even know each other exists. Um, and I can't see how they could possibly say it's not enforceable. It's entirely enforceable and cities do it all over the country. So I, I was really concerned of it, not just on this specific issue, which I think is something that should be addressed, but that it feels like a slippery slope to start saying cities can't, uh, you know, use the tools that they have to help support appropriate policy to guide their communities for resilience into the future. So uh, I think it's, this would be a, a great letter to join on uh, on behalf of the city of Maplewood personally. Thank you, Commissioner Redmond. Uh, any other thoughts or comments uh, regarding this new letter? Uh, I just would uh, I don't have didn't have I don't have all the background that Commissioner Redmond did so that already is a learning um, mm -hmm. moment as far as that goes. But just having skimmed this letter, it, it does make sense. I think. Um, you know, there's a, a need to kind of push uh, forward and allow that uh, allow for local governments to to do so that they know their community is best. So. Um, I think, you know, I learned, um, you know, with the light rail transportation in St. Paul, you know, there was a, a quite a big issue with the number of parking spaces, like a, along University Avenue there and along the light rail route. Previously, you know, you required X number of parking spaces mm -hmm. if you were, you know, adding apartment buildings and additional retail. Well, now you have this public transportation line that's there to get people in and out and, uh, you know, re requiring that small cramped space to have X number of, of parking spaces just doesn't make sense anymore. So it's always worth reconsidering um, the ordinances and policies that are there. So um, yeah, making sure there's a mechanism to do that and have some common sense in the process as well. So I'm for signing on. Thank you. Yeah. Um, again, I'm. This is a new issue, and so um, I I agree with Commissioner Pauser and that. And Commissioner Redmond, that this is something that would be valuable to keep it within a local area. So, um, but that also is the end of our agenda. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion for adjournment. I'll second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that concludes the meeting of the Environmental and Natural Resources Commission. It is 820.